the mic. Hosted by four-time Emmy-nominated producer Frank Pace and retired New York City firefighter, 9-11 first responder, and Vietnam vet Billy O'Connor. Today's guests, two-time UCLA basketball champion John Vallely. My brother, my brother Frankie, how are you, pal? How you doing this morning? I'm doing great. Yeah? Our guest today is John Vallely, two-time All-American at UCLA and national champion, uh, teammate of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Uh, he should be a fine guest. Great volleyball, volleyball player, too. He was. Fantastic. He was. Played against Wilter Stilt. He did. And he played did. with Wilter Stilt. He did. Yeah, it'd be cool. It'd be that cool. asked me, that reminds me, did you watch the basketball game this week or not? Yeah, I watched the the, the, the championship game. I I, it should, I always watch the Final Four, but I didn't catch it. But I did watch the championship game. What was the spread? Oh, they're amazing. <laughs> four. Four was the line, and they won by three. And the over and under? Oh, right on the money. It was like uh, 148. 140, whatever it was, it was a half a point. It they was missed a half, it by a half point. Missed it by a half. Depending on whether you're over. Unbelievable. I don't know how they do it. And you know what gets me? They get the half times too. If you look at the half time spreads, they're right on the money. It's always like the last shot. I tell you, they should let bookmakers run this bloody country. They they they, they already do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> probably. But they you think we'd have a deficit if the bookies ran the country? No. No. We got it. Well, as quickly as they give away money. I tell you, I, I we had a Supreme Court nominee. Can we talk about this? Sure. Why? Why can't we? Well, I don't it's, know. It's, it's our saying. show. We can do anything we want. Absolutely. Let me show you something. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see. Ain't much to see. <laughs> the only guy in the room who can run into a hot into a wall with a hot on and break his nose. My longest appendage, people. I'm very proud of it. But yeah, so I mean, uh, they had a Supreme Court. Uh, uh, Kataja Brown, right? Yep. She got. She got uh, you know it's remarkable. You saw the questions that they were asking. I mean, it was I know. ridiculous. Uh, it's become so polarized. It's so crazy. You know what I find interesting, and I don't know how many people know this, but the Supreme Court. You know what qualifications you have to be. To none. Person? None. We've, Absolutely none. We've done this before. Yeah. None. Absolutely none. And and they were they were an afterthought. You don't have to Supreme even Court. be an attorney. No. None at all. I could nominate. Well, I couldn't, but a president could nominate you to be a Supreme Court justice. Right. But and, you know what I think? Interesting thing. The vote was fifty-three forty-seven. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Of the three Republicans that broke, one of them was Mitt Romney. Right. I believe Mitt Romney's setting himself up to run for president again because you know, he's courting the middle of the road Republican people, and he just might get them. Well. We're so skewed now in politics that, I mean, look at Biden. Biden was a political windsock. I know. I mean, both sides of the aisle. He played it that way. And uh, people wanted a political windsock after, after, after yeah, what's and, been going on. And I'm sure his, his son is guilty of all sorts of improprieties. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Like Derek, <laughs> Derek, Derek, our third man in the booth, Derek Harris, is laughing Just hysterically. Spit take. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's guilty yeah. of all sorts huh? of improprieties, never thinking that his father would become president of the United States. Without a doubt. But could you handle Romney right now? I could handle Romney. I mean, at least he's... That's what I mean. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, all of a sudden he don't look that bad. I mean, having met him in person... Have you? You would hate him. <laughs> He's the single most boring person. He's <laughs> more boring than Joe Biden. <laughs> wow. And he's wow. he's less genuine. I mean he he's was less a, genuine than of, Biden. Of course, because he was running a big hedge fund. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you know Corporations are people, my friend. You know, that line. you know he's dirty. Yeah. But you know, like you said, you could handle Romney now. I could. So if it came to Romney or Trump, I think Romney's got a good shot. If it came to Romney or that woman in Wyoming or Montana or whatever Governor Nome is, or whatever, yeah, the person in South Carolina is. I think people are delighted just to have somebody rational. It's it's gone beyond whether well, or not they have Romney's not rational, but <laughs> he's got magic underwear. Yeah, he's got magic underwear. <laughs> he's got magic underwear. So, what story were you going to tell me? Oh. uh let me just finish up on the Supreme okay. Court thing. The Supreme Court was an afterthought. Article 3 of the Constitution, Marshall, Marbury versus Madison in 1803 was John Marshall usurping power for the Supreme Court. That's where the Supreme Court got all its power, 
it gave him judicial review, he called it, mm-hmm. which was, that's where they got all the power from. Real, realistically, they shouldn't have the power they have. But forget about that. I got to tell you, Eric, I, remember right. I, Right. I know who you are. <laughs> Remember how I told you that, that they're listening? I don't know who they are. Is they're listening? But this, this is the clincher. This happened to me two days ago. You know, I'm always making jokes about having gone ass. You know, I got no ass. Right. Like my, my pants don't stay up. I've, all my life, I had the GAs. You know, my right. friends, even in grammar school, you say you got the GAs. You know, what the, the GA, gone ass. I started getting... And I never put this on on any internet or nothing like that. Just talk Bel- about belts or suspenders. Suspenders. <laughs> <laughs> I started getting all these answers. Suspenders. I said, "Look at this shit! Holy crap!" Well, this. you know, so many people now are watching these podcasts. It would be easy for anybody to oh, get that inference that you got the gone ass and send you some suspenders. <laughs> so you think somebody listening to a podcast is going to tip somebody? No, they're listening to it. Somebody's listening. Listen, corporations, the government, I don't know who it is, but they're definitely listening because there's no way I start seeing all these ads. Everything pops up. Suspenders, suspenders, suspenders. But I started laughing. Well, you, you're going to no, get... ain't listening. Godass.com is sending you <laughs> suspenders. <laughs> Godass.com. By the way, we should check that and see if that site is... Uh... Well, well it's, the site is available. We can put it up on our website <laughs> and, and sell suspenders to people with gone asses. <laughs> I would, uh, that's a good rap name too, Frank. Gone ass. Gone ass, the rapper. Yeah. What do you think? You think that could be my rap name, Derek? I do. I don't ever want to go you're, that you're, route. You're going to be DJ Bougie Billy. <laughs> <laughs> Boozy. 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 <laughs> <laughs> DJ Lack a Booty. Lack a Booty Billy. How about Lack a Booty? That has a, you know, that has a ring to it. Lack a Booty Billy. Yeah. Lack yeah, tell booty. me the story. Huh? Tell me the story you're going to tell me. That is the story. That's the story? Yeah, suspenders. I couldn't believe it. Oh. What? You want a punchline? <laughs> Ain't no punchline. <laughs> then let's get to our our guest, John Vallely. Oh yeah, man, it's gonna be an interesting interview. Yeah, Looking forward for to sure. John, Derek, can you bring in our guest, John Vallely? Okay, we'll get John up. Hey, John, how are you? I'm doing good. Thank you, Frank. Uh, that's my partner Billy O'Connor, and that's my friend Derek Harris on the console. Welcome, hey, Billy and Derek. Good morning. Good morning to you, know. John. Pleasure to have you on, pal. Really nice. Thank to you. Meet you. Pleasure. So, so I'll start you off with: Did you see the NCAA tournament this week? Yes, I did. And, and what was your take on it? Um. Well, look, the game has changed with a three-point line. We used to go inside out. You know, we get something into an artist or, you know, and they did a little bit of it with Kansas with the big guy in the middle. Um, and then we would move it out when people doubled him or tripled him and that kind of thing. We ran a high post offense during my second year at UCLA that opened up the for play for everybody. The work around the perimeter is certainly different. It's amazing how such big guys can actually shoot those shots and make them from the three point line because. In my day, there weren't many seven-footers that could shoot from that distance. I like watching the defense. It was fun to watch. Um, and I thought there were some great games. I watched the uh, Sweet 16 forward. I thought the Sweet 16 was the most interesting. I think I actually watched eight hours one day. Wow. And, oh. Oh. and uh, I, I love watching super competitive games. And certainly the final was that way. You played two. NCAA championships teams. You played in 1969 with Lou Alcindor slash Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And then you played in the 1970 game against Jacksonville uh, with a whole new cast of characters just about. Uh, how did how how did the two teams differ? Well, with Lou Alcindor, obviously the game, our offense revolved around him. We pressed all over the court and he was the last man standing at the back end of the court. So if somebody got past the, the zone press that we used to run, they'd run into Lou Alcindor, and that's not much fun. And so that part of it was different. Uh, during my senior year, uh, Sidney Wicks's junior year, Sidney was the guy who was in back. But uh, we had Curtis Rowe that was off the 69 team and on the 70 team as well. And uh, with Sidney Wicks added and Henry Bibby, 
and Steve Patterson. Steve Patterson played against Lucinder every day in practice and uh, finally got to take that starting role as a high post uh, offensive player. And so very different teams. The 69 team was one that was stacked up with Lou Alcindor. And uh, I really got into using the pyramid of success in my life in the second year, the, six, the 70 team. I was captain. We weren't expected to win. Artis Gilmore and friends were out there on the East Coast uh, building a great team as well. And there were many other great teams, including uh, Kentucky and, and uh, others. But uh, I just think it was a time for me to realize that all I could do was control what I could control, even though that's true in 69. In 70, I realized that I have to take it off my head, off my forehead, off my mental take, and just enjoy accomplishing what I could do for the team. And so we did, and darn if we didn't follow the pyramid of success. Had a couple challenging events during the year, and uh, we ended up winning the championship. Why don't you t- talk about some of those challenging uh, 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 events during the year? Well, and one this, of course, this is the 69 70 season, correct? Yes, yes, we won in 70. With this is that second year, um, I was scoring too many points, according to a couple of my teammates. And I was, after we lost a game in Oregon with Stan Loves, uh, he was the great center up there in Oregon. Uh, a couple of the guys were concerned that I was scoring too much. I was averaging, I think, 19 a game or something. Sidney Wicks was averaging 15, and, and they didn't like it that I was leading the team in scoring. So Henry Bibby is funny. I'll tell you the rest of the story in a moment, but it's really good. Um, he came to me with another guy and said, um, "We, the black guys are concerned that with so many great black players on the team that we have a white guy leading the team in scoring. So I had to do something about that. I, I could go to Coach Wooden, which he would just have a fit. I could go to Sydney, which I believe is maybe where it came from. Or I could just be quiet, try to do a jump stop and pivot and dump it inside somehow and take a couple less shots. Well, uh, what happened is my scoring went from 19 to, I think it was 16. And Sydney's went from 15 to 18 or 19. And guess what? There wasn't another word said about that event that took place after the game, the loss in Oregon, and we won the championship. Now, upon Coach Wooden's death, um, we had a large memorial service in Poly Pavilion, and uh, after the service, Henry Bibby came up to me. Now, this is, what, 45 years later? I can't remember exactly what your coach passed, but it was years ago. But he came up to me at the memorial service and he tapped me on the hip and he says, Hey, John, we can't have a white guy leading the team in sport. <laughs> you know, Henry, Henry had coached for what, 30 years or something or in the NBA. Can you imagine the amount of stories that he could remember? But he remembered that one. And so we both had a really good laugh and we had a great time together at UCLA. He was a great shooter. I was a good shooter. And the high post offense really developed great opportunities for me to play and for him to play from the outside. And we had a good time together that day. Well, we talk about, we, you talk about a white guy leading this team in scoring. Uh, in the semifinal game in 69 versus Drake, you outscored Kareem. You were the leading scorer in the game with 29 points, and I believe Kareem had 27. Is, do you remember that? Yeah. Well, Frank, I do remember that because from time to time when I've been introduced along with, Kareem, I tease him that, you know, he was trying to win his third national championship, which in a row, which had never been done before. And there I was scoring 29 points and he scored 25. So my remark is, Kareem, you would have never become anything if it wasn't for me. (laughs) (laughs) You said that uh, you could have taken that complaint about the white guy scoring too much to wooden but he would have went bananas. Can you elaborate on that a little more? Like he would have said, like, doesn't matter who's scoring or just win. Billy, you're right on with the question, and you're actually answering the question. Coach would have uh, disregarded that type of thinking. Uh, He never looked at people in the way that color mattered. 
but I think because of the social times that we were in in the late '60s and early '70s, that uh, and of course now too that we're still going through this situation. Um, I think I think he would have straightened everybody up on the matter in just a paragraph or less. And if there was another thing about it, there would have been trouble, big trouble. It didn't make any difference. He, he took the best players he could have and put them on the court. His job was to coach us, and our job was to play the game and give it our all. He was far more concerned about effort. And if there was an issue with one guy scoring too much, he would take care of it. And he would do it on the sideline, not in front of anybody else. Is it true that he never mentioned the word win? He mentioned the word win on the first day that we gathered as a team in a small room where he wanted to discuss the goals of the year and explain to us his way of thinking about finding our best effort to learn about competitive greatness. And he said, everybody wants to win. Who doesn't want to win? And, and he said, but that, I don't believe should be our goal. It could be the result of what we do, but the goal is to find our own competitive greatness, which is to be the best we can be when our best is needed. And he said, I ask each of you to consider this way of thinking, that if we can find peace about our effort to be the best that we can be, then we don't need to worry about the results. They will take care of themselves. Peace, meaning absence of conflict absence of conflict in your mind and your heart about your effort. If we can achieve that, then I think we'll be happy with the results, he said. So, winning and losing were only stated in that very beginning and never again. Each year, he made a similar speech. That's almost like an Eastern philosophy, it seems to me, like, you know, this idea of peace. Did he ever lose his temper? Have you ever seen him lose his temper? Was he soft-spoken? or? Um, yes, he. I have seen him lose his temper. Uh, it was in my junior year, Lou Alcindor's senior year, and a nice guy named Bill Sweet was on our team. Coach, uh, in the, I think it was in the semifinal. Yeah, it was the semifinal when I had that big scoring game. And Bill uh, was a backup guard at that time. Good player. Had been at UCLA for five years. And it was his time to play. Well, we got into the latter half, I believe, of the second half. I think I fouled out with about two or three minutes to go. And Coach had to put a guard in, and he put a guard in other than Bill. And Bill just had a cow. So at some point, I think Bill was asked to go into the game late, and he simply stood up, left the bench, and went into the locker room. It was there that Coach, after that semifinal game, walked in and read the riot act to Sweek. I remember coming in as one of the players and hearing this confrontation taking place in the shower. Sweek was in the shower. Coach had walked in and went <laughs> and, and gave him so much of his mind. Without ever using a curse word. <laughs> I don't know because I wasn't there for the entire time. <laughs> he was pretty funny how he did different things. He would call us out at different times. One time he put me at point guard in practice to see if I could do that, put Henry Bibby on the side just to change up the relationship there. And uh, we went against the zone, and I think I threw the ball away two times in a row. Well, Coach had gone up into the top of the Poly Pavilion to take a look and see what the team looked like from up there. Of course, we didn't see where he went. He would just simply leave the floor and then go climb the stairs and go up there. Well, when I threw the ball away two times, I heard him walk down. He, he, first, we could see him walk down the steps then. And he goes, John, pass the ball to somebody on your own team. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he used to be really good, I believe, at razzing the opposing players. But he would do it through that folded up, or the rolled up uh, program that he always had. Uh, near his side. Is that true? He was uh, probably as competitive a person as you would ever meet. Yeah. And 
he didn't want to distract from the game as far as the people behind the bench. But what went on in front of the bench with officials and with opposing players was a different thing. He, he would tease. And, of course, when he teased, you'd have players that were uh, maybe listening to too much. John Wooden is saying these things. And if he could razz somebody, he did. Well, you, you got the nickname from Wooden, uh, Mr. Money. And before you came on, Frank had said to me, he said, you know, I think that John today could probably go on to a big show and with absolutely no pressure on him. Do you feel like you, you were, like, relieved of some of that pressure because of the pyramid of success and because of this Eastern philosophy type thing? Or, you know, it's a, a higher power, higher hands than mine. Well, Billy, that's a great question because – you know, as a 19-year-old who's learning about the Pyramid of Success, looking at the 15 characteristics in that document, industriousness, enthusiasm, loyalty, cooperation, friendship, intentness, initiative, poise, confidence, building the skills, teamwork, eagerness to sacrifice personal interest for the glory of the team, became one of the most valuable things in my life as far as my marriage, as far as my parental responsibility. I created a culture from that document in my business, especially the retail store that we had in Newport Beach that was very successful. People loved it. They loved the idea of creating this special culture. Well, anyway, when I married and uh, my wife gave birth to two children, three years apart, is about the time of the second birth that I started to go through the spiritual thing. I said, something's missing. Can it be just competitive greatness? Can it just be the best you can be and it's over? Well, anyway, after a year of study and consideration, I asked God into my life. And so when you think about that Eastern philosophy of finding some higher power, yes, I went through that too. Well, it definitely would, would be something I would imagine. I mean, the never being competitive at all, especially at your level, but I would imagine that that would take a lot of the pressure off. Like the shot's not really mine. It's in somebody else's hands, and it is what it is. Really, exactly as you say. You, you do what you can control, what you can control. You do what you can do. Don't worry about the results. Now, in business, I did the exact same thing. I did the exact same thing in marriage. Do the best that you can do to become the best partner you can be. And some of the guys didn't adopt this philosophy after they got through the education at UCLA, I found that a huge asset in my business, in decision-making and, and fighting the Bank of America on a, on a huge lawsuit um, and, and winning only at the upper level and appeals. You know, there, there are, you know, Coach Wood used to say, surround yourself with people and ideas that you respect. And so, Billy, when you focus on that, that maybe it's a harmony that goes on in your mind with God, as to who you are, it doesn't mean you're not going to miss a free throw or miss a jump shot, but all you can do is give your best effort. He always would tell us there's always going to be someone taller, someone shorter, someone faster, someone slower, and uh, someone smarter than you and someone not as smart as you. But find your gift, do what you can do. Now, after he would teach all this stuff, Billy, he'd say to everybody in the room, this is just something I developed over 14 years, and I found it really useful, particularly in my English classes, my academic classes that I was teaching. But it's such a great tool to use. If you've got something better, I encourage you to use that. Yeah. He, so he, he, he didn't dictate you have to do my mental approach. He developed it over 14 years. Uh, yes. It's a pyramid of success. And he was also a great basketball player at Purdue, an All-American. Did you know that, Billy? No. No, I didn't know that. Yep. Uh, and Wood was, Wood was below six feet, right? He wasn't a, a tall man, was he? He's like five foot nine, five, five nine, right around there. Uh -huh. And uh, he shot underhanded. He shot two-handed. He actually was a very good shooter from short range. But, you know, when you get older, the legs go away. So you lose a little power. But uh, I imagine that he was incredibly quick. Yeah. Wow. And incredibly intelligent on the court. John, uh, let me ask you, why did you go to Orange Coast <laughs> College right out of high school instead of going directly to UCLA? 
I wasn't invited to go to UCLA. I was invited to go uh, by Bob Boyd, the coach at USC. It, he said if I would go to junior college and try to, you know, play there, get my grades up. I came out of high school with a solid C plus grade point average and a jump shot. So there was <laughs> plenty, plenty of improvement to take place. <laughs> and so uh, I think Nebraska was interested in me and I got a picture of the uh, arena with all the blown snow in front of it. <laughs> yeah, for a beach boy like you, no, no way. <laughs> Wait a minute, little beach rat from Balboa Island. <laughs> to Nebraska and travel through the snow, the blowing snow. And uh, even though Stu Lance, who eventually became a teammate of mine when I played for the Houston Rockets, but Stu was there and he was quite a, a, a great player just ahead of my time there. Anyway, I can't remember who else, but if I could go to Orange Coast, have some good years there. I knew there were four or five other good players coming into Orange Coast. If I could go there and play well, perhaps more opportunity would come, and that's exactly what happened. So Bob Boyd, where they said, go ahead and play a year at Orange Coast, I'll pick you up after the fir after that first year. And then he came to me after that first year, and he says, John, go another year at Orange Coast, I'll pick you up after the second year. Well, in the meantime, Jerry Norman became interested in me at UCLA. We happened to go up and play, uh, our JC team went up and played the freshman team at UCLA. Uh, Curtis Rowe was on that UCLA team. Uh, let's see who else was on that. Steve Patterson, I guess, was on that team. Andy, anyway, we Andy Hill. There. Andy Andy was on that team. No, Andy was uh, younger than me. He wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't there yet. He was a year or two younger than me. And uh, we went up there and had a good game. I, we lost to the UCLA team, but I think I scored something like thirty or thirty-five points. And so they saw that I could shoot, and they knew that Lou Alcindor, they were going to lose Mike Warren and, and Lucius Allen, so they needed to have somebody who could shoot a ball, and they thought maybe I would fit in, even though I had been playing forward at that point. I wasn't dribbling the ball up and down the court as would be needed at UCLA. But uh, they invited me, and then I thought, well, what the heck? How will I ever know if I could fit into such a program like that unless I tried and, of course, my college coach at Orange Coast said, John, why don't you go someplace where you're sure you could play? It would be a better, uh, a better experience for you. My mother wondered if I was fast enough, which was questionable. And with that, I decided to go to UCLA to find out. And I started out the fifth guard amongst all these uh, guys that had been there for several years and worked my way up. So let me ask you, uh, it just occurred to me, was Paul Westfall at USC at that time? Because I think during those years, you, Paul West, UCLA was number one, but USC was in the top five. But in order to, quali in order to qualify, you had to win the conference because only 16 teams and play-ins, so 24 teams went to the tournament that year, was – did you play against Westfall? And had you played against Westfall, if you had become a teammate of Westfall, do you think the competitive competitive balance competitive balance would have switched to USC? Uh, that would be a stretch for me to consider, I guess, because our front line was when you got people like Sidney Wicks and Curtis Rowe. Although they had a guy named Riley that was a really good player at SC. Um, actually, Paul was highly recruited to UCLA the year that I came in. Um, if I, if Paul had come in the year that I came in, I'm not, let's see. Yeah, he would have come in. And maybe I never got to play or, or uh, it would have been a battle between Paul and Henry and myself for uh, starting guard positions. Wow. But, um, Paul didn't like Sidney Wicks. He played against Sidney in quite a few pickup games and different events, and just he didn't like their boastful nature. Both Sidney and Curtis would kind of, they were kind of Hollywood like. They had a lot of fun being who they were at the time. And so Paul decided to go to USC. Wow. 
How? Paul, Paul, and I, Paul and I became good friends over the years, and uh, I sure miss him. Yeah, he was a, a good guy. Good guy. Good guy. He Very good guy. And, and then he became a great coach at Phoenix as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Paul had a great career. I mean, fantastic athlete. So what was it like coming out of Orange Coast College and walking on a court with Lou Alcindor, Lynn, Lynn Shackelford, Kenny Heights, Mike Warren, all those great players, a two-time national champion. What was it like for you? Mike, Mike Warren had already graduated. He, he was a senior on the team before I got okay. there. The rest of the fellows you mentioned were there. And uh, I walked out there and simply had the responsibility to, to give it my all. And what was it like? I mean, we didn't even get on the court when it became really strange. When Coach had us in that meeting when he was telling us about the Pyramid of Success, started out by telling us to take our socks and shoes off. And I'll never forget sitting in the room with Lou Alcindor, uh, two people away. And, of course, I was in awe of his ability and his, uh, his size and what he could do on the basketball court, his legendary status at that point. And in walks Coach Wood, and the first thing he says is, take your socks and shoes off. I want to show you how to put on your socks and shoes. And Lou Alcindor says, come on, Coach, not the sock story again. <laughs> <laughs> this is Lou Alcindor's fourth year to learn how to put on a pair of socks and shoes. Coach says to Lou Alcindor, Lou, you pay attention. And so he continued, and we all took our socks and shoes off. He says, I want you to pull the socks up in a way that there's no wrinkle in that sock. You make sure that the seam is in the right place. I don't want one of you to get a blister as a result of not knowing how to put on your socks properly and shoes. I don't want one of you to have downtime on my basketball team as a result of something we didn't cover in the details. Amazing. That's an amazing story. What did you so that foundation, Billy. That foundation, Billy, I think is really important because I've used it in the talks I've done over the years as a beginning to how you have to have a foundation in the pyramid of success, the industriousness, the enthusiasm, loyalty, you know, friendship, uh, all the things that are in the pyramid, the characteristics that make us up as a human being are foundational to the good life experience. It's also foundational to cover all the details to make your best basketball team. His job was to make the best team. He couldn't control what these, I mean, he could control by, by you know, shipping people in and out of the game. But the players are the ones who win the championships. And he always admitted that. It wasn't so much about him. It was more about the players that they had. He hated the nickname Wizard of Westwood, didn't he? <laughs> you got some good stuff here, Frank. One time we were speaking at an engagement down here in Newport for the Pediatric Cancer Research Foundation, which I sit on the board of, and I do a thing called Dribble for the Cure that's become a nice fundraiser. With Jerry okay. Wilson, with my friend Jerry Wilson. Oh, oh, you know Jerry well. Okay, good. Yeah, Jerry is just awesome. She's our executive director now, and she's been here for about 10 years. She's done a terrific job. I've been on the board for about 40 years now. And uh, uh, the Wizard of Westwood, I invited Coach to come down and to one of our pediatric cancer group meetings. It was actually a, a dinner, a formal dinner event. And Coach and I would sit on the, uh, on the, on the, uh, the floor of this, this event and we would have a conversation. Well, afterwards I took him home and we got up to the uh, back of his condominium up in the valley and we were up to the gate where you had to open the gate and he was fumbling around and couldn't get the, the gate open so I could drive him in to take him home. And I said, come on, Co come on, you're supposed to be the wizard of Westwood and you can't get into your own home? He said, John, don't you call me the wizard of Westwood. He, he actually was kind of upset and it was pretty funny because I, I was just going after him at that point, you know. And it's just a, a cackle. It's, it's good. Yeah. I love I love the attention to detail that you know uh, the preparation preparation being you know the key to success. I remember reading about Lincoln. He said if he had eight hours to cut down a tree, he'd spend six hours sharpening his axe. Well, Lincoln was one of his one of Coach Wooden's role models, wasn't he? Lincoln and Mother Teresa. Yeah, um, 
Lincoln is the one who taught Coach, who taught me about the comet. It's, 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 quote, surround yourself with people and ideas that you respect. Imagine Lincoln doing that in the day. Wow. When he was going through the Civil War and all the things that were going on in those days. Lincoln was a role model for Coach Wooden. And then, of course, his father, Joshua Wooden, was a great man, too. And it's the other two. These are the two quotes that Coach taught me that made such a big difference. Never try to be better than someone else, but never cease trying to be the best that you can be. Again, there'll always be someone smarter, someone not as smart, someone taller, faster. That is irrelevant. And Joshua wouldn't taught that to coach, and he carried it on to us. And I am very appreciative. And when coach was about to pass away, I received a message that he would not be long for this world. And I was invited to go up and see him at the hospital. And so I grabbed Karen, my wife, now of 53 years. And I said, Karen, we got to get up and see Coach. He's not long for the world. we got to say goodbye to him. We jumped in the car, and we're driving up the 405 freeway to get to UCLA. And I'm thinking, what do I say to a man who's meant so much to me and taught me so many good things about life? So I freed up my mind, walked in the door, and there was Coach in bed. He was alert enough to, to, to see us, and he could hear us. He wasn't speaking at that time. And I said, Coach, this is Team Vowell. You know the one, that, the, 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 the team you put together some, you know, 40 years ago, plus years ago, when I was uh, the stupid little basketball brat that was going off to play for the Atlanta Hawks. And I, I Coach, I just wanted to come up here and I wanted to thank you for helping me make that decision. Before I could ask the question of you, Coach, should I marry this girl? You stuck your finger in my chest. Before I could ask that question, you said, you marry that girl. And I said, Coach, I always thought that if Karen had had a jump shot uh, and, and, and could play, she would have played ahead of me on the UCLA Bruin team because she had so much character. You identified with her. You helped me make that decision as a young 21-year-old. And I said, Coach, the other thing I want to thank you for is all that you taught me in the pyramid of success and the way to live life. He looked up at Karen and me, and we both we all held hands. And he said, I love you. And we never saw him again. Wow. Wow. You contracted non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in 2003. And I know you said it was those were dark days for you. Uh, at your darkest, you <coughs> contacted Coach Wooden. And didn't he give you motivation to con continue the fight when you were about ready to give up? Oh, uh, I... I'm not sure I ever had, well, the, the time when I was about to give up, I wasn't speaking to anybody. I was in uh, the Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle, and they gave me radiation and chemotherapy, and my mouth was raw. I couldn't eat. I was being fed by a tube, and I was in and out of real consciousness. I was on substantive painkillers, but I, Coach, we talked several times during that ordeal, as we did when we lost my daughter, too, who also fought a two-and-a-half-year fight. And uh, his encouraging word would just be that, you know, something simple like God has a plan for each of us, and we're all pulling for you and hope everything goes well. And that was more it than anything else. It wasn't... Uh, particularly spiritual. But he gave you, and he was an impetus for you to move on. And Absolutely, absolutely. Well, and his force was in the form of the pyramid again. Yeah. Be your best when your best is needed. Control what you can control. Well, the only thing we could control is I have this wonderful wife who's with me the whole time following what the drugs are that they're giving me, asking questions of the doctors and nurses, the PAs, uh, and making sure that the insurance is doing what they're supposed to do and keeping in contact with the community around us that was praying for me. And it was just that, that all uh, 
the team that was put together is a fantastic experience. Even though it didn't work up uh, at the Hutch in Seattle, and we ended up down at MD Anderson in Texas, in Houston, for my second transplant, I always felt that there were people around that were flooding me with this help and love and uh, a particular great experience for me is in the second transplant when I was using somebody else's cells. Mr. Hofmeister from Germany, he would he donated five million stem cells, put, they put them in a plastic bag, brought them over to me. They wiped me out again in Houston, and I went down to the bottom again. And my prayer went something like, God, what do you want me to know about this? I mean, is this the time that that I leave Karen and she will have lost her daughter and her husband? Or is there something else that I need to know? Because at that point, being a faith-driven person that I was, I could just leave and go to heaven. Or I could stay if I was needed in some way. And it came into prayer, you know, like you get when you contemplate things, depending on your faith uh, way. Uh, I heard from God, what are you thinking about, John? I said, well, I'm thinking about all the people around me that have helped me and prayed for me. I would get calls from Kareem or from uh, Steve Patterson or, you know, Mike Warren or Lucius, uh, Andy Hill was very instrumental in keeping people speaking to me when they could. And I'm thinking about all those people, God. He said, well, what do you think about all those people? I said, I think I should be praying for their well-being and for their hope and for their carrying on with a life that is special. And when I started to do that, prayer for all the people around me, I was lifted like you can't imagine. I could not get out of bed. I wasn't eating. I was stuck at the very bottom. I had watched the stem cells drip into my system through apheresis from Mr. Hoffmeister, and I didn't know if it was going to work or not. But in that prayer, I had great hope. And I don't think there's much more you can ask for. I'm not going to say that's the reason I was cured, but I'm just telling you what happened to me. Yeah, that's, that's an amazing story. It is indeed. I, to, to think of the adversity that you're going through, I mean, death is about the biggest game you can play. And uh, it seemed to even strengthen your marriage and strengthen you as a person. Instead of uh, hurting you, it made you stronger. Oh, Billy, you sound like a preacher now. <laughs> I'm anything but, John. <laughs> I know. I know your background, Billy. I heard about you. And, uh, but you did right. Uh, rephrase what you just said again so I can share it out. The adversity that you faced. Yeah. You know, usually when somebody faces that kind of adversity, especially somebody married, it can either wreck your marriage or it can make it stronger. In your case, it inevitably made it stronger, but it seemed to make you stronger as a person as well, well facing it, that adversity. Well, you're dead right on that. And I immediately flow from this comment between the two of us to my daughter, who passed away as a 12-year-old. She wanted to live so badly. Why do I have to die, she asked me. Will I live until Christmas? Two questions that came to me on a drive home. And I said to her, I don't know if I'm going to live until Christmas. And But I do know this, we all have to die. But I said to her, I said, Aaron, one thing I know, if our faith is true, and by the way, her hero is God, then we're going to end up in a place in heaven, and we're going to see each other again. And it's going to be phenomenal. There'll be no chemo. There'll be no radiation. There'll be just nothing but happiness and peace. And so when it came time for me to go through it, having lost a daughter who was in heaven, I thought, what the heck? The worst that's going to happen to me is I'm going to be in heaven with God and see my daughter again. So I actually had the lighter of the two, a much lighter of the two sentences. Aaron had to go off 
at a very young age. But imagine by faith believing that something as good as getting to see your daughter again in heaven would be phenomenal. I did see her in a dream about three months after she passed. It was as vivid as I can see looking out the window to the bay here on the island, Novel Island. And uh, I walked in a room with my wife to see a, the physician who had cared for her. For some reason, we were meeting. And in the side door, when she opened the door, she walked in, and it was as vivid as I could be personally two feet from you right now. And she didn't say anything. There was just a glow that said, look, everything's good. Get on with it. I'm in, everything is perfect. So with that idea and having the hope that heaven is real, then I was able to carry forward in spite of anything that would come my way. If Erin could fight it and did it the way she did and give it her all, I could too. John, let me ask you a question uh, because I believe that, you know, dreams, people come to us in dreams and that's their way of, of visiting us uh, now. Uh, was Erin, how old was Erin in that dream? Was she 12 years old or what, had she matured into oh. a lady that she... No. Excellent point. She was in a outfit that was in her probably right in the year that she passed with a look on her face that penetrated like you can't believe. Wow. Wow. So that brings us to, you know, my close friend for 40 years, Rod Carew. And you have traveled similar paths. Uh, you both lost daughters. You both have suffered uh, almost debilitating uh, life tragedies. Um, how how did you meet Rod? <coughs> and uh, tell me about the time we all got together for dinner at Coach Wooden's. But first, tell me about Rod and, and your relationship with Rod and how it has grown over well, the years. Rod and I met as a result of him joining with the Pediatric Cancer Research Foundation to start a golf tournament down here in Orange County. And we just spent some time together and we just really meshed nicely in our conversation. Uh, we had huge love for our kids and Rod really wanted to make a difference in the name of his daughter and I wanted to do the same. And so we just did things that changed the world for these kids that have to fight cancer. We just were very disturbed that there wasn't answers yet. Since those days when we first met, suddenly we moved from approximately overall a 40% survival rate for these kids to about 90%. Oh, and so exactly. we, we feel like we've made a big difference in a, in a real life experience. We're not taking all the credit for this. We're just saying that we focused on investing our time and money resources in trying to make a better place for the kids. And that has panned out. Um, I always love Coach Wooden's statement about that. You know, when you win the national championship, I remember going in the locker room and all he had to say to us was, great job, guys. Now don't go out and make fools of yourselves. So Rod and I would not take any credit except for making the effort to add to a better life for others. Yeah, you, you used your celebrity in a positive way. I, I, I think... Especially Rod, he's, you know, the golf tournament has produced great, great amounts of money. That's actually been in place longer than the dribble for the cure event that I do. I think he's in his 25th year. 25th, 26th year tell, coming up. Tell us yeah, more yeah. about it, dribble for the cure. Tell us some more about that, John. Dribble for the cure. Tell our audience what that's more about. The dribble for the cure started 13, 14 years ago, I guess. We're going into our 14th year coming up. And I went over to USC. Uh, to watch Dribble for the Cure that was actually organized by the coach over there. I can't, first, I'm embarrassed to not remember the name of the coach who's such a nice guy. He's down at... Uh, Morrison? No. 
after him. Uh, oh, he was fired from USC during the debacle with the great football star that was there. This man had nothing to do with the debacle that took place. So it was roughly 2005? Uh, yes. Derek, can you look up the UCLA, USC basketball coach in 2005 and while John continues with the story? And let's see, five, it would have been, yes, about a little bit later than that. Oh, gosh. He's down in Texas. Well, Derek will look it up. Okay. Tim anyway, Tim I saw you. Tim Floyd, you got it. <laughs> Ooh, Derek, you're good. So, yeah, Tim Floyd, one of the nicest guys you'd ever run into, coaching USC. We got together at my house. He came down to Newport. And we talked, and I went up and saw the event, and I said, why am I not doing this at UCLA? They didn't have as big of, a, of an event as we end up having at UCLA, maybe because our basketball support is larger uh, than SC's. But I said, I could do that. And I went over and I talked to the athletic director and ended up uh, putting together the dribble for the cure at UCLA. It became a hit right away. And now we've raised a little over, I think it's close to $2 million doing dribble for the cure. And the kids, we'll get a thousand kids that sign up and then they'll make teams and they'll go out and get sponsors and that sort of thing. And so we might have 25 or 30 teams that go and dribble out around the campus on a one mile course. They'll come back into the poly pavilion. Uh, they'll get to meet on that dribbling around the campus, the men's and women's basketball teams, the, track team will come out and walk with us. The volleyball team comes out and walks with us. Uh, Corey Close and her basketball team, of course, the girls are really uh, uh, supportive of the event. So we try to get the students on campus to join as well. And uh, we get sponsorship from all over. And a couple of uh, alums were great in the early sponsorship. Eddie Sheldrake, who's still living at, I think, 95 years old. And Jerry Norman, who was an assistant coach for George, uh, for Coach Wooden, has been a sponsor for many, many years, as well as others. And so it just became a great event in supporting kids. And the kids have a great time meeting these great basketball stars, the athletes at UCLA. The athletes get to go and do something for somebody else and uh, without expectation of something in return. The greatest gift, as Coach Wooden would say. and. Uh, we've just made a real hit out of it. Then, after the success at UCLA, uh, the first it was with, uh, oh God, this mind is so bad. <laughs> anyway, Lavin, three of us. We're all the same boat, John. <laughs> anyway, Lavin, Lavin took over. Steve Lavin, who just took a job down in San Diego, I guess. And uh, he, uh, he became the coach at UCLA. We became friends when he took over, and he wanted to continue the dribble for the cure. Forget how it ended up at uh, St. John's. But he went to St. John's. I called Steve up. I said, Steve, you've seen Dribble for the Cure. Let's do it at St. John's. He said, let's do it. We got a hold of the athletic director. They liked the idea. You know, this this uh, religious, somewhat religious school uh, could do something for others with Dribble for the Cure. So they're in about their 10th year, I think, now. And so together, the two projects have raised, like I said, almost Right around $2 million. That's great. That's and now great. they're joining, now the PCRF, Pediatric Cancer Research Foundation, is joining with the V Foundation to add additional universities. So we'll see how that pans out. The V Foundation's for Jimmy Valvano. Yes. Yep. So I would be remiss if I didn't have to ask you about the 1970 championship game, uh, NCAA championship game, Jacksonville versus UCLA. What do you remember about that game? I remember that we jumped out to a pretty big nine-point lead, I guess, eight minutes into the game. And, uh, well, why don't you tell me from your point of view what happened? Well, I certainly remember that, that you were jumping out to a nine-point lead. <laughs> and I remember that we were trying to figure out what the heck we're going to do with Iris Gilmore because he clearly had a huge physical advantage. Uh, down low, even though he didn't shoot well that that night, we had Sidney Wicks fronting artists down low, and about 
with five or six minutes left in the first half, we were down by the nine points. We went to a full court press, created a several turnovers, opened up a couple of fast breaks where we went down and made shots. And I think by halftime, we were up by four or five points. And so then we started to gain that confidence again. Well, let me stop, let me stop you because didn't you say coach wouldn't end a timeout when, when I interviewed you for Jacksonville, who you said coach wouldn't was at not so much at a loss, but Sydney suggested he front artist. And I was, a, you're, you're stealing my stories. Frank. <laughs> then I, I will keep quiet. That was the next step. Sydney was playing in front. The ball was getting thrown over the top, even though Sydney could jump and, you know, do anything a guy six foot nine, two hundred and thirty five pounds built like Superman could do. Artis was getting we, we we couldn't really stop him from getting his shots in that first half. He says, Coach, let me try playing behind him. And so instead of fronting, he started to play behind Artis and we fronted I can't remember who I think we put Steve Patterson in front to, to I, the I think we put Steve Patterson in front and Sid Sydney behind him. And so so Steve six nine um, was was a really good player, but not a great jumper. So artists would get the ball on several occasions in that first half, towards the end there of the half. And when artists went up for his little jump shot, it was shooting down at the basket. So Sydney went up between artists and the basket. And when we all got together, Frank, as you remember, with Coach and Rod Carew and, and all together that one time at Andy Hills, Artis restated the fact that Sydney was goaltending his shot. Now, if Artis could have dunked the ball in those days, it would have been a different story because everybody would have been thrown into the basket, including Sydney. But because Sydney was able to go up from behind and block the shot, especially when it was if perhaps on its downward uh, move, then we put a stop to the inside game of Jacksonville. So, per, so perhaps Lou Alcindor helped you win that game as well because the dunk was banned as as a way to uh, control Lou Alcindor. Aren't these events great? Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I would have never won that next championship with my buddies on the 1970 team unless Lou Alcindor had been so great to get the dunk banned. And that's why we won the 70 championship. I love that story. You said it, not me. You said it, not me. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> and uh, I next time I see uh, Kareem, I got to tell him that. I got to tell him that story. That's a good one. <laughs> you know, dribble, dribble for the cure. Well, hang on a second. So I'm sorry. Let, let's continue with it. Uh, you, you had a great tournament as well. You were named the 1970 uh, NCAA uh, championship all tournament team. Uh, but um, we then <coughs> got, a, we had a dinner with coach Wooden. I think you and Andy Hill auctioned off a dinner with coach Wooden uh, in, in 2002 or three or so. And I, I got, I said to, to, to Rod, we're going to have to win this dinner. So uh, we'll, we'll all invite a couple of people. So I, I invited artists to appear uh, come from Jacksonville. Vaughn Wedeking, who was your counterpart at Jacksonville, uh, was a great uh, player who passed young early, passed at 52 years old. Um, and we had a great dinner with Coach Wooden. Uh, the thing I remember most about that is Coach wanted to talk baseball with Rod most of the night. Uh, but he had his, his favorite dinner, chicken, uh, with blueberry pie. And it was a great, memorable night. That was a great night. Uh, Coach's favorite sport was baseball. He loved the mental requirement in pitching and catching and placing people on the field and all of the mental uh, responsibility a coach had. I think he loved that. Um, so much went on during the game in baseball, maybe versus basketball, where basketball we had to prepare uh, so much mentally and physically 
But baseball seemed to be more of a mental game, even though the athletes are phenomenal in baseball. I'm not taking that away from any player that can play professional baseball. But uh, you love talking the game with guys. And, and of course, Rod is a intellect as well when it comes to talking about baseball, having been around it his entire life and all the things that he achieved. So a lot of the conversation was listening to those two guys talk. It was fun. Yeah. However, however, Artis Kilmore made a big point that uh, the Jacksonville University probably would have won the national championship if Sydney hadn't goaltended his shots. And my comment was simply, well, the rules are the rules. We play by the game. The officials call the game the way they do. And Artis, you came in second that night. <laughs> He, he is the nicest guy in the world. We laughed. We had fun. Von Wedekin was there. It was great to see him. I didn't really know him hardly at all. And uh, super smart guy. I think he was a dentist. A dentist in Portland, Oregon. Yep. Uh, became a dentist and a super nice guy. Just great conversation about, a bunch of, with a bunch of people who had great experiences in life. Yeah, they shared one moment in time. Uh, exactly. And, and it, was, it, it was a great moment for us, and it was a great moment for you. Uh, Absolutely, and and you are also a Hall of Fame beach volleyball player. Is that correct? Yeah, I think it's good and possibly bad. It's uh, you know growing up at the beach, uh, you know surfing. I surfed for fifty years, and I loved the the atmosphere on the beach. I mean, all the girls and the sunshine, and and the requirements for athleticism in deep sand. Uh, I learned to start, I started playing volleyball when I was about 15. And of course I was growing at the time like crazy. And so by the time I was, uh, I think I was 18 or 19 when Ron Von Hagen, who was the biggest name in the sport of two man beach volleyball asked me to play with him. Of course I was honored and it was like stepping onto the floor with Lou Alcindor as far as getting a chance to play with him and, and, uh, so I love playing the game, but I don't think it was good for my knees. Uh, I was a pretty, pretty good jumper in those days. I could get up in the air and I could hit the ball and I could even rebound the ball once in a while, and shoot the jump shot. But uh, I was taking cortisone when I was at UCLA. Wow. Each year I had to take cortisone shots in my knees. And I could continue on at that point. But I think had I not played beach volleyball during my UCLA years, Maybe my basketball would have been better on a longer-term basis. But then again, would you trade those beach volleyball wins, Manhattan Beach, Hermosa, every every single uh, event on the West Coast, Ron Von Hagen and I won. And that was one of the goals that I had. And so I was lucky to get to do that. So your knees, your knees worked against you when you were the number one draft choice of the Atlanta Hawks. Uh, do, you, do you think the uh, your knees worked against you, uh, and it cost you a you know four, five, six years more years? I, I have no idea because you have to be in the right place at the right time right. Um, in that business. I do think it worked against me. Uh, anytime your knees are in pain and you're having to try to keep up with athletes that are actually better athletes than you are, it's a tough it's a tough call. I can still shoot the ball and everything, but I played. In Atlanta, for the Hawks, behind Walt Hazard and uh, Pistol Pete, Maravich was ahead of me, and uh, and so I forget who the other guys on the team were. There, there were four guards that were pretty darn good at the game, and so I played against uh, uh, behind a couple of big names there. And then when I went to the Houston Rockets, I was playing behind uh, Calvin Murphy, who was a big star at the time, and and uh, Stu Lance who had a great NBA career, and a fellow named Mike Newland. All those guys played, I think, 12 years or 10, something like that. So I was maybe in the wrong place at the wrong time. But when I got cut from Houston, I thought, you know what? This pro sport thing is not as much fun as it was before. I had made some really good money because I was a high draft choice, and I was very blessed because of that and saved every dollar that we made so that I could start private business when I finished. And uh, 
I was just very fortunate to get out of it what I did. Then I had one more year in Brussels, Belgium. I was invited to go over and be a player coach on the in the International Basketball Association, started by some entrepreneurs here in America. And we went over there with 10 players, uh, each team. I think there was five franchises in, in uh, Israel and Brussels, uh, where I was, and in uh, Germany. And I don't think we had a team in France to make any difference, but... I got to play and coach a team over there that did quite well. And I had many of the players that had been just cut from the NBA. And so that was a lot of fun. Oops, I think I goofed here. No, you're okay. You're good. fine. You're okay. You still got, you still got me? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. We got you. Oops. We got you. Okay. We got you. I'm not, I'm not going to worry about it then. Don't, uh, don't worry about uh, it. So uh, that's an interesting uh, that you could have maybe played a few more years, uh, but it would if you didn't play beach volleyball, but those beach volleyball memories uh, played a great part in your life and made you a diversified person as well. Absolutely. Um, so many great relationships, shish, great relationships were created from that experience. I think uh, an example of a guy that I always admired was Keith Erickson. who played for the Lakers for a long time. And he was a phenomenal volleyball player as well. As was Wilt. Huh? As was Wilt. No, Wilt was not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Wilt, Wilt was tall. <laughs> Wilt was tall, and he had very long arms. And if you set Wilt properly, there is no way anybody was going to dig the ball in a game of volleyball. We used to do a little exhibition team, with, which included Wilt and Keith Erickson and myself, and Larry Rundle, who was one of the best players in volleyball ever. We had this team that used to go around and play six minutes. So before against six, but Wilt was our star on the team and he was the draw. It was a way to pick up a couple bucks in the summertime. And uh, Wilt was an absolute character, of course, but uh, he really, he couldn't pass the ball. He couldn't set the ball. And one of my good friends at six foot one loved playing against Wilt because he said, Wilt can't block. Wow. In other words, Wilt would go up and he didn't know how to move his hands properly or move his arms. If he could get up, you know, and block a ball, it was sometimes an accident as far as this guy was concerned. So we always used to kind of make fun behind Wilt's back that, you know, as much as he loved the beach and the girls and maybe a party, it was, Wilt was participating for his, because of his love of the environment. Again, same thing that I think I was there for just to enjoy this great environment and get to do something athletically on the beach. So Wolf really didn't start playing volleyball until he started playing for the Lakers, right? He moved to the beach. That's when he started becoming interested in volleyball. Yes, that, that is absolutely right. He uh, ended up down in Santa Monica at the beach. He meets a guy named Gene Selznick, who was one of the heroes of old time volleyball. And Gene was a character too. He was kind of our little, he was our general manager. And, uh, so Will was on this team, and so uh, Toshi Toyota was on it. Ronnie Lang played once in a while, I think. Anyway, we had basically five guys would show up and play this exhibition, sort of a game against six men, whatever the local group put together. And it was quite fun. But uh, after playing several events, there I am playing beach volleyball on the weekends. I'm doing an exhibition during the week someplace. And I decided that, well, I'm a national champion. This is after we won the uh, the, the, the uh, 1969 championship, and I'm a national champion in basketball. And now I'm winning all the beach volleyball tournaments, so I'm somebody. So I go to Gene Selznick and I said, Gene, I said I think I should make more than a hundred a night, hundred dollars a night, because Wilt would go after the match was over straight to the box office. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. I'm going to invalidate that 1970 championship. Then I'm going to presented to Jacksonville because you were making a hundred dollars and you were an NC that was an NCAA violation. So oh, this is just, this is just a story, Frank. This uh, is a story. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice try, Frank. Okay. You'll have a hard time proving this. Anyway. <laughs> so I went to Selznick and I said, Gene, I think I should make more than a hundred nine you know, this was after the senior year. It wasn't after the junior year. Oh, okay. It was after the senior year. Gotcha. Now, make sure you write that down properly, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, I went to Gene. I said, well, I need to make something more than that. I think I should be making $400 a night. 
four hundred dollars a night would only be uh, you know say twenty percent of the gross that we're taking in, or maybe a little bit more. But you know, I am who I am. He says, "Let me go talk to Will about that. I'll get back to you." A week later, he comes back to me. He says, "John, he says I presented to Wilt your proposal." And his response was, we don't need John anymore. <laughs> so even though I had a hand in starting professional volleyball, I, uh, I, I didn't last long in it. <laughs> Nobody was making money on beach volleyball back in those days. It didn't happen until several years after I was done. So, wow. You know, but, the, the yellow sheet on you, John, when I was looking to doing some research on you, it says you dribbled with your left hand and shot with your right hand, which strikes me as... You were ambidextrous, basically. I mean, nobody can dribble with their left hand and can't dribble with their right. And if you shoot with your right, obviously, I mean, was was volleyball help you be that that, that two handed player? I mean, well, I think volleyball helps you be very aware of everything that's around you, like is required on the basketball court. For some reason, my left hand was more comfortable dribbling the ball. I seemed to have more control over it. I could do a little crossover dribble. I could do a change of pace, you know, change of direction type of thing with my left hand. For some reason, I wasn't as comfortable with the right. But the one thing I know, when I shot the jump shot, I liked going to my left and popping up real quick and shooting over the top of the person that was guarding me. So um, I, in order to be at the level of many of the other players I played against, would have had to have been a better dribbler with my right hand. Oh, I could do it, but I don't know. Coach Wooden and uh, Denny Crum during my senior year at UCLA were trying to figure out how to speed me up, you know. So they had me just dribble up and down the court uh, on the side court just as fast as I could. And they actually, Denny Crum actually timed me because they felt I was a little too slow. And so while I had skill in shooting and skill in understanding the game and would play a little bit of defense, uh, I, I didn't have as much athletic power as many of the other guys that probably I played against. Who's the toughest guy you ever guarded, John? Oh, God. Well, Jerry West is pretty hard to guard. Um, in fact, impossible to guard because he could really get up quick with his jump shot. Uh, I got stuck with Oscar Robertson once or Whoa. twice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Oscar, Oscar was six five, or so wasn't well, he? Six five, five, yeah. No, he he took me down one time in I'll never forget it in Milwaukee when they had that championship team. Um, they ran a play, and my old teammate Lou Al Cinders playing de de on defense, and so I'm trying to guard somebody and Lou says watch out John it's coming your way and I ended up on the left side guarding Oscar so here's the six foot five guy backing me down and he just he's 215 or 20 pounds back in this 180 80 pound guy at six five backs me down just turns around and shoots the ball back a little bank shot Jerry West did the same thing in the form to me. And, uh, but then there were some quick guys that were no fun to guard. Uh, forget, uh, not, not Iverson. Uh, it was way before that. I, I can't remember all the names. I'm sorry about that. What was, but, what was Pistol Pete like? Oh my God. <laughs> well, this is a story that would last. This is a long story, you guys. Yeah. yeah what's uh, happening? Well, Pistol was uh, a phenomenal athlete, and we met as rookies in rookie camp and enjoyed playing together, I think. Uh, I don't like Garden Pistol. It's hard to guard him. He's a tremendous athlete, could really dribble the ball, and was a pretty good shooter at that time. I would say not a great shooter, but he was – but anyway um, – the whole the whole sport was around pistol, and the pistol. I'll never forget in rookie camp we were rooming together too. They they put us together. Pistol I think was the second or third pick that year, and you know and I was farther down the line. And so he said to me, he says, John, he says, what was it about UCLA? He says, 
I always wanted to win a championship. I never won a championship. What was it about UCLA that caused you guys to win so much? And I just immediately went, oh, Pistol, you have no idea. And I started to try to explain to him. And first of all, a Pistol, we never talked about winning. We never talked about losing. We talked about things like uh, teamwork, eagerness to, eager to, eagerness to sacrifice personal interests for the glory of the unit, the team, and loyalty and cooperation. So as I was sharing these concepts with him, he started to mumble them a little bit. Like, you know, it meant he never heard that kind of thinking. And uh, so it was interesting to share with him what it was like to be on a championship team where the culture was so good. And yet he had been come from a culture where it was all about him. He really was, Pistol was a circus animal. I, I think of him as a circus animal. And so talented. The fastest guy I ever saw from the end line to the other end line. Whoa. He could outrun anybody. He, he uh, Herm Gilliam, who was extremely fast, he could beat Herm by a full step from one end to the other. So with that athleticism, it was really something. And then later on in my life, I was talking to Coach Wooden about pistol. And he said, yeah, he went to a coach went down to speak at a camp uh, down in the south. And Pistol's father, I uh, can't remember his first name. Uh, Press. Press. Press Mavage. Press. Press and Coach were talking. And Coach Wooden said to Press, Press, you're, you, what you're doing with your son, the way you're coaching and, and developing him, you're creating a monster. And Press said to Coach, oh, no, I'm creating the first million-dollar player in the NBA. So obviously there was a big difference in the approach to how Press would coach, who coached Pistol at LSU, and how Coach Wooden would have coached Pistol. Pistol came to UCLA. They they brought the team up. LSU came up to play us, or out to play us. And uh, we couldn't wait to play against them. Henry Bibby and I were the guards at the time. And we ended up going ahead by, I think, 30 or so, or 40 points. And Pistol was having a tough night because we were guarding him pretty good. And he, in the last uh, three or four minutes of the game, all of our bench was playing, he scored like 20 points. So it made it look like with him scoring 24 points that night that he had had this great night, but uh, not so great. Well, what's the best? I got to ask you, what the basketball back there? Is that the 69 game, the 70 game, or is that uh, a pro game, the basketball that you have behind you? That was a college game that I just mentioned to you, that I just shared with you. My experience with the Atlanta Hawks is Pistol had a really tough time. There was great dissension on the Atlanta Hawks at that time. We had Lou Hudson, great star in the NBA. Bill Bridges was a forward. He was in his 10th year, I think. and. There were all kinds of issues between the veterans, all of us, and Pistol. And I was a roommate and uh, uh, of Pistol. And Pistol liked to go out and have a good time. And, you know, he would go out and come back at 3 in the morning sometimes. And one night he came in and he was pretty messed up. And uh, Pistol kind of had a – I said, Pistol, it's 3 in the morning and you're coming in. And he turns the lights on. He starts – back in his bag. We have to leave around 6.30 or 7 in the morning. I said, Pistol, turn the light off and get into bed. Get some rest. Come on. He says, come on. Let's fight. <laughs> he, he said, you're nothing but a nigger lover. And, uh, and I said, oh, come on, Pistol. Give me a break. I'm in bed, you know. So I got out of bed. I went down to Lou Hudson and Bill Bridges. They were, in, they were rooming together, and Bill Bridges was our captain. I said, guys, I just had this experience with Pistol. I don't know what to do. He said, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. And something else had happened between them and Pistol that day. So Pistol had come in and having had a little alcohol and was crazy. And so I moved out into another room, and uh, I think I ended up rooming with Jimmy Davis at that point, who was a really cool guy. Um, no, no longer with us, unfortunately. but uh, and. 
you know, they had to deal with Bissell. It was just really a dark experience. Yeah. Well, uh, Derek, uh, in closing, uh, I want to guess, ask Derek if he's got a question because Derek's got an apparel company in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, he may have a question or something he want to ask you about that. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm coming to your house, and we're gonna have a meeting about that. Just, <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, just, just kidding. But that that, that is cool. I, I'd I'd be curious to hear about that. But we probably shouldn't put that in the show. Um, I have a question about the 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 pyramid. It seems like it's. Would you say it's sort of like an operating system for 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 life? Is that how you? Would? Absolutely, Derek. I mean, it, I'm doing a talk. <laughs> I think it's on April 29th, to a bunch of women who have supported the Hogue Hospital Foundation. It's called the Circle 1000. People that have been major donors for, I don't know, 25 or 30 years. And I get to go speak to these women. And one of the things I'm going to present, I always present, the pyramid of success and how valuable it's been for me. And so I look forward to sharing with them that all this talk about K through 12 and what we're teaching our kids, whether it be gender identity or racism or all this crap is useless. If we were to teach the pyramid of success in terms that would fit K through 12, which admittedly, K is going to be more difficult. But if you were to train people with Coach Wooden's pyramid of success each year, instead of wasting time on all this foolishness and division, and we tried to teach people to find their personal best, knowing that not one of us is like another. That's one of the things I loved about Coach Wooden's story, too, is that it was always, nobody's like you. Find your personal best. Be inspired by getting peace of mind about your effort. And if you've done that, you don't have to worry about the results. Bad things are going to happen to all of us. Good things are going to happen to us. But follow a storyline. Follow a motivational tool that can help you through all kinds of challenge and change. And so I always look forward to sharing at least this in that short term. And then I use it in my application in fighting disease with my daughter and also my own disease, how I used all the terms in the pyramid of success to get along, work with the doctors, work with, you know, work with the culture that you're developing, whether it's business, sport, marriage, or otherwise. And so, yes, I find this as a foundational tool for living life. Add to that faith that God has a plan for you, and there's an experience that he has complete control of, none of us knowing when we come into the world or when we're going to go out of the world. It's simply to make the best we can of what we got. So what's wrong with all these characteristics? Why don't we just use those and stop all this foolishness? Got it, got it. And, and another question I had, uh, because just thinking about the application of this pyramid, how is this implemented? Because, you know, it's sort of like an interface, you got, you got young guys coming from various backgrounds, various, various uh, uh, educational um, uh, backgrounds as well. What does a guy know about, you know, an uh, 18, 19 year old kid? What does he know about self-control and and loyalty and enthusiasm. I mean, some of those things are kind of evident, but but other things, other some of those phrases, you don't really have. People don't have uh, background examples of that. So how how did how did Coach Wooden uh, express examples of that 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 kids could grasp? The tool, the fifteen characteristics that Coach Wooden put into the Pyramid of Success, those characteristics were studied by Coach Wooden. He shoveled different vocabulary words in and out for 14 years, okay. trying to find the answer so that he could talk to a parent of a student who wondered why his or her child got a B instead of an A or a C instead of an A. And Coach would always respond when he got this all under his mind, in, in mind, that your child may be fantastic at math, 
Your child may be great at English. I'm teaching English here. Your child may become some great sport person or creative artist. I only want to try to help your child be the best he can be in this subject of English. When they go to math, they have to go through this again. How could have I done this? I would have had to have teachers and mentors from the very beginning talking about these simple characteristics in terms that they could relate to. Hmm. Would they get it? Not necessarily. But doesn't it seem valid that learning skill, learning what team spirit means, self-control, alertness, initiative, friendship? I mean, I have could go on with story after story in each of these characteristics in my life and what I learned. So what would you put in its place, I would ask? And I would encourage any coach, and I know many teachers and coaches are using the pyramid of success, to dive into this. I spoke to Orange Coast colleagues this year about this, and I had people from very different backgrounds in that room. And they loved the idea of it's not about your race, it's not about any education that you had in the past, it's about you finding your personal best to become the best you're capable of becoming. And these kids in this college, they, they had a terrible year. But I know that that day, they were asking the kind of questions that were absolutely valid for their life at that time. How you get and reach the younger kids? I got a copy of the pyramid down here that's for young kids. I don't have it here, so I won't go go grab it for you. But it's on the wall here in the uh, man cave. And uh, I truly believe that we could start at a very low level teaching kids this sort of thing. Uh, I think gender identity will come out later. Maybe they can figure it out for themselves. Uh, I hate the idea that because somebody is from a different race, that there would be some sort of misunderstanding between different races. And again, I find this is the glue. When I look at the pyramid of success and I adaptability, sincerity, honesty, reliability, this is the glue that holds the 15 characteristics together, integrity and patience. Being alert to weakness. I mean, fighting with each other over things that are not useful makes no sense to me. Self-control is so important. And one of the biggest ones I use when I talk to younger people is initiative. Cultivating the ability to make decisions and think alone. Not follow the crowd when you don't need to. I mean, we're losing, what, 10,000 people a year to fentanyl overdose. That's not a good decision to try a pill like that. And if you don't know what's in that pill, we need to say no. So I'm simply saying that I love this. And intentness, which is to finish the job. My job is to continue with what I've learned and how I can share it with others, having learned it from one of the greatest teachers, not the greatest coach, because I can't talk about that, but one of the great teachers of all time. Coach preferred the term teacher over coach. Teaching people how to make a better life for themselves. Got it. Got it. And then oh, let one more statement is, uh, so you said Coach Wooden is, was about 5'9"? Yes. Okay, perfect. That's, that's, a, that's the perfect height. Appreciate that. <laughs> that's a tall Derek is. Derek, that must be your height. I knew that without you <laughs> asking the question. Well, John, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on, brother. It was a real pleasure to meet you. And, you know, you didn't really give us basketball lessons, volleyball lessons. You gave us life lessons. And uh, certainly, certainly you learned them from, uh, from, the, from the teacher himself, you know. And uh, we certainly appreciate you passing them on to us. And in closing, how are you hitting them? I'm uh, shooting in the... Middle to low 80s. Of course. Of course. <laughs> of course you are. I only play once every week. I used to play. I used to get to play in the earlier years, three or four times a week, when I had several different business interests that allowed me time to get out there. But uh, 
the body is not what it used to be. I went through a terrible shing shingles experience. My right arm really got messed up. But anyway, that's another story. And uh, uh, I, I still love playing the game. I can't wait to watch the uh, Open that's taking place right now on, on TV today. I love watching that game. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, John. You've been a great guest. And we really, really, really appreciate you being making time for us today. My pleasure, Frank. Love you, Frank. And nice to see you, Billy. And I can identify with some of your history, Billy. Oh. Um, <laughs> not all of it. <laughs> well, thank God I wasn't on the beach back then, John. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to spit out any more than that. And Derek, thanks for controlling the show and uh, letting me be part of it. Great. Thanks so much, John. Hey, guys. Take care. Good guy. Good yeah, guy. remarkable guy. He remarkable. Was a, he, he was a uh, great guest. He was a terrific fella, and uh, he, he he taught us a lot about uh, Coach Wooden and what was going on with him and how he was uh, he, he affected his life, and he's still affecting lives today. Yeah, well, both him and Rod, you know, had gone through that awful, awful thing. Every parent's nightmare that they lose a child, you know. Uh, I think the Arabs, I, I had said this once before, that the Arabs have this curse. It's the worst thing you can say to somebody. And it doesn't sound that bad. It said, may you outlive your children. Yeah. well, that's Which is a terrible, terrible thing to say to anybody. Yep. Uh, but between him and Rod, I mean, they took this adversity and turned it around to do, to do really great things. You know? In, indeed. And so with that, why don't we sign off for this week and uh, say goodbye. Say goodbye. Say goodbye, Say goodbye. Billy. Say goodbye, Say Frank. goodbye Billy. Derek, Say goodbye, Derek. Brother. Adios. 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 Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. And if you want to read more about that championship game, uh, If These Lips Could Talk has a great, great chapter on it and wooden. And uh, and there are a lot of books about And there's a great Wood. chapter about Rod Carew. will be our next guest yeah. as well. Coming up next week, one of the most talented players to ever don a major league uniform, Rod Carew. 